Well, it's, as always, it's, it's a great privilege for me to, uh, to be asked to do the message. Um, I got a text from Pastor Bill on Friday, and he, he was sick, and so I said, don't worry about it, you know, you know get rest, get well. Um, as uh, they used to say in seminary, something similar to what Carrie said a couple months ago, uh, they told us to be ready to marry, bury, preach or pray at a moment's notice, and so uh, we also had our grandkids over the weekend all night last night, so, but I, I promise no references to Paw Patrol or Masha and the Bear or anything like that, so, although it's tempting. So, <clears throat> it's December 31st, uh, starting a new year tomorrow. Uh, there's supposed to be 12 days of Christmas, but to many of us it was over earlier in the week. Uh, maybe, maybe you've already taken down your Christmas tree and dragged it to the curb um, and, of course, left a trail of orange needles behind it that are almost impossible to get out of a rug. Uh, or if you've got an artificial tree, you learn uh, a law of physics that's not in any physics book, and that is that the tree will not go back into the same box out of which it came. You know... How is that possible? So, uh, and of course, you may be finding tinsel everywhere. Um, years ago, our cat used to eat tinsel. So, but if Christmas is over, you may be thinking, uh, what now? Uh, or to put it more negatively, now what? <laughs> I could have spoken this morning about uh, New Year's resolutions. I quit doing those years ago. It's too much like putting us under the law. Uh, I do set goals, though. I found out, you know, I set goals for the year, and but only in, you know, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit do I try to achieve those goals, because I found Lance is prone to failure. So, and many of you may have had a bad year this last year. Um, maybe have had some tough times. Uh, experts tell us that this is actually the most depressing uh, time of the year. So I thought, well, I, you know, let's. Uh, start out with a little lift. Um, so I hope by the time you leave here this morning that you'll uh, smile a little more, lift your head up a little more, and perhaps have a little more spring in your step. Uh, I've selected an extremely familiar text. Uh, we hear it or recite it uh, nearly every Christmas. Uh, but most of it focuses on uh, what happens after Christmas. Uh, much after, as we'll see. So I thought everyone should get a large dose today. And this is, of course, is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 that uh, Lynn read to us earlier. And that first line, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. That's Christmas. We know that. Uh, Isaiah predicted that about 700 years before the very first Christmas. Uh, but the rest of the text we'll see... Um, doesn't have to do with the first coming, but rather the second coming. Uh, from the second line of verse 6 down through verse 7. So, and like I say, all of you have heard this text at Christmas time. Uh, I, I think most churches probably don't focus on what happens after that first line. But I think it's very exciting. Um, you know, from the time I start, started studying that, over 50 years ago, I'm still excited today about the future for planet Earth. So um, anyway, I think the what now really pops with enthusiasm, uh, with optimism. So between verse 6 and verse 6b, between the first line and the second line, uh, Isaiah jumps over not only Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but also the church age, the rapture, and the tribulation period. And so uh, this is what we sometimes call the double reference in, in, uh, in prophecy, or sometimes uh, dual meaning. It's called different things. But think of it this way. Um, my oldest daughter used to live in Woodland Park, Colorado, and she could open her front door and see Pikes Peak. But there were, it, and it really stood out. It really popped. But there were many other mountains there, and you couldn't see some of the out, the mountains if a mountain in front of it was the same height or taller. It was superimposed on the mountain behind it, and in many passages of, 
passages of Scripture, that's what we have, uh, especially related to the first and second comings of Christ. In the text, they're superimposed on one another, and so the original readers probably didn't realize there were two comings of Christ, a first and a, and a second, or Advent, if you like, first and second Advent. Of course, it was all future at the time that Isaiah wrote it, uh, and so from the second line on through verse 7 is still future to us today, more than 2,000 years in, uh, in, in counting. <clears throat> and I like to say that the prophets change lanes without signaling. You know, they'll go from one subject to another very quickly, and uh, Isaiah certainly did here. And in other texts, Isaiah did that a lot. So here's the what now from the second line, and so I'm going to focus on that. <clears throat> And there's this large gap chronologically. Now, now you might wonder why I'm so certain that Isaiah, after predicting the Messiah's birth in the first line of verse 6, jumps way ahead to the Messianic kingdom. Let me give you five reasons why the next two lines in all of verse 7 is still future. So we'll be looking at those reasons sequentially as they unfold here in this little text. So, and... Uh, and by the way, I've got a lot of scripture references. Um, they're in the notes. And so if you want to see those scripture references, look in the notes. But uh, time won't permit us really to, uh, you know, look at those today. So this is kind of an overview, really. So it starts out saying, the government will rest on his shoulders. Now, um, <clears throat> notice there's a change in verb tense. Um, the, he the Hebrew is uh, a little beyond our scope this morning, but the translators are right. You may see a change from past tense to future tense. The government will rest on his shoulders, and that's, that's correct uh, in the translation. So uh, Jesus hadn't yet started to reign, uh, and I'll spend some time demonstrating that later, but the Rim Roman Empire continued to dominate and in fact oppose Christianity after Jesus' ascension. So it should be obvious that, that this reign where the government rests on his shoulders is still future. And so it goes on to say this very familiar text, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, um, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And you might say, well, that's not future, that's right now. Now it is true that he is all of that and much more. We believe that. If we studied the, just the titles of Christ, we'd spend a month of Sundays. So, but by and large, the world hates Jesus, and it doesn't recognize him as this name. So, um, it's not until after Christ returns and reigns that the world will acknowledge him, uh, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So, that's still future. Now, here... At First Congregational, churches all across the country, believers, yes, we acknowledge that name, but uh, to the world still future. Um, verse, uh, verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Um, you know, I'd love to see world peace, and I think we should, be, we should work toward that end as best we can. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers. But there are some 30 ongoing wars on the planet right now, uh, not the least of which, of course, is, is taking place in the land of Israel right now. So it's, uh, there's always the potential for peace from believer to believer. Um, we have individual peace through Christ, uh, Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ our Lord. You have peace. I have peace personally. But as far as world peace, that's, that's going to take a Messiah king. Hint, hint. <laughs> okay. Um, the next line in verse 7, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. Um, notice the reference to throne of David. And a lot of believers think that's the throne upon which he is sitting right now. His heaven heavenly or celestial throne. Well, that's never called the throne of David. That's the same throne 
he had before the incarnation, before the Word became flesh. He had a heavenly throne. He returned to that heavenly throne. The Davidic throne is always earthly, uh, terrestrial, and it's always associated with Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem. So this future uh, reign of Christ will be on the throne of David. He is a descendant of the tribe of Judah through David. Uh, Twelve times in the New Testament he's called the son of David. And he will literally sit on that throne. Now some folks talk about the throne of the heart that Christ is ruling in my heart. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's a good concept. Uh, it's a metaphor actually. Uh, but that's not the kingdom. And that will change the individual but it won't change the world. So, uh, Matthew 25, 31, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. And that's, that's the Davidic throne. And I started to read uh, in, ver- in uh, 7c here, To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Uh, This is the character of the kingdom, justice and righteousness. But as I look around, I can't think of a nation on earth that could be so characterized. If anything, I think that we're the diametrical opposite of justice and righteousness, uh, including America. And if if you don't believe that, just open up the newspaper, turn on the news, and there's anything but. So, so far you may not feel very uplifted. Uh, Well, hold on, I've got some applications here. We'll systematically go through some of the characteristics of that coming kingdom. Uh, I actually have 24 characteristics, but I'm going to kind of, I'll spend a little time on some of these and then I'll blow through the rest of them, if that. So, but understand too, um, you know, because he did pass over the rapture, that's the next event on God's prophetic clock. Um, you know, here at First Congregational, it's right in the doctrinal statement, we believe in the imminency of, of the rapture. And so, uh, there's a, at least a dozen texts that talk about the rapture occurring at any moment. And so, nothing needs to be fulfilled before that. Uh, we may not make it out of the service. So, or it could be 10 or 20 years from now, who knows. But um, there are some um, really good things that will happen to us in the rapture. Uh, that's actually the first resurrection. And we, were, we are going to get some tremendous benefits that we will carry with us from, uh, from the rapture, through the tribulation, the messianic kingdom, and even into the eternal state. They're even better than the benefits I took from General Motors. So... <laughs> So, but we won't go there. Number one, no more physical or emotional pain. Revelation 21.4. I know many of you are looking for this one. Um, He said, he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The Lord's going to reach into us. He's going to fix everything that's broken, both inside and out. Uh, Physically, Spiritually, emotionally, we're going to get fixed. And I know I need a lot of fixing. <laughs> so, um, and our bodies, as you well know, will be similar to Christ's after they're, they're raised again. And so, um, or I should say raised, sorry. First uh, John 3, 2, 3, uh, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Uh, It has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So I'm looking forward to a new body at almost 73. This one's uh, declining, to say the least. Number two, deluxe accommodations. John 4, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And I can't imagine that. Now, some of you may like to do home maintenance and home repairs and yard work. I'm not one of those people. Uh, So I look forward to this deluxe accommodations, better than the Ritz-Carlton. 
uh, probably make Gross Point look shabby. And so uh, that's going to be exciting, folks. It's free. You know, our salvation is free. All these things coming, that's free to us. Isn't that amazing? I have never gotten over that. So, and I think that's probably when you read about the New Jerusalem, that's probably what we're reading about is when the New Jerusalem comes down to the New Earth, I think, you know, our uh, condominium or apartment or whatever it is will be uh, located in that. Number three, no more false religion, no more Islam, no more Hinduism, no more Buddhism, or any other isms, asms, or spasms. They're all going to, only biblical Christianity will be all over the whole earth. Won't that be exciting? Um, Number four, public education will be dramatically changed. We'll be back to having prayer in public schools before class, after class, maybe during class, and uh, a different view of the origin of the universe will be taught. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Number five, the earth will be universally sanctified, including, but not limited to, the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, and the sanctity of Israel. Number six, no more war. Uh, And I I have to clarify here, uh, some folks will uh, misunderstand what Isaiah said in in, uh, chapter two, or Micah in chapter four, about plowing swords into plowshares and uh, spears into pruning hooks. Uh, Remember, that's when Christ returns. You know, I can, uh, you know, I'm kind of a gun collector, I have to admit. I won't need those anymore, uh, except for fun, maybe. I don't know. But uh, there won't be any more war over the whole planet, um, which is amazing. But that's something Christ will bring about. Uh, And by the way, Joel chapter 3, verse 10, Joel has that inverted. He says, uh, hammer your uh, plowshare into a sword and your pruning hook into a spear. Because in the context, it's the tribulation period, so you better have guns in addition to butter. (laughs) So, but of course, we won't be here in in my my view. Number seven, the greatest economic boon of all time. You won't have to be looking for a job. It'll come looking for you. Uh, Remember that the tribulation period will have really uh, decimated the earth. And so a lot of reconstruction will have to take place. Uh, And new construction. Imagine all the new church buildings constructed. And I believe that Ezekiel's temple, that millennial temple, will be uh, constructed during that time. So going to have to have a lot of workers. Number eight, no more elections. In uh, Matthew 19, 28, Jesus promised the apostles that when he comes and sits on his glorious throne, they would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the uh, tribes of of Israel. And we're told that we will reign with Christ. And so uh, I don't know what job I'm going to have. I'm going to be appointed to do something. Uh, I'll be privileged to do whatever it is, but uh, we'll be reigning with Christ. And so all jobs, all positions of authority will be by appointment, either by Jesus or his representatives. So there'll be no more elections, no more primaries, no more sleazy campaign ads, mudslinging, and graveyard votes, no more hanging chads. Can you imagine putting that in the past? And all that effort and energy can be put into something else. So uh, nine, Christ's future millennial rule will be, of course, earthly, terrestrial. Um, 10, Israel will be regathered to their land and it'll be an expanded land, much greater. <clears throat> Eleven, there will be a purge of living Jews, um, and this, this is like a judgment of the Jews. They get their own special judgment, and of course, as Paul says, all Israel will be saved, so only believing Jews, or believing Gentiles for that matter, will enter this kingdom. Um, Israel is regenerated and repents nationally, so Israel will finally experience national regeneration, national repentance. Uh, And that will be true, too, of uh, other nations. There will be a judgment of Gentile nations, number 13. 
and that is, uh, uh, that's the figure used like in Matthew 25 of the sheep and the goats. There'll be a resurrection of Old Testament believers, number 14, number 15, resurrection of tribulation martyrs. There'll be a lot of believers in the tribulation period who will be killed for their faith. Number 16, like, and it's so sad, uh, you may have seen those Nigerian Christians that were massacred. That was just terrible, terrible. Um, universal peace, I alluded to this, number 16, but we really will have world peace, finally. So all those beauty contestants who you know, miss America and whatever, they say they're, they want world peace, they'll get it. 17, universal holiness and righteousness. Can you imagine when you don't have to go through what your kids and grandkids are watching on TV and, and, and really watch it like a hawk? You won't have to do that. When Christ returns, he'll make sure that you could turn on the TV channel and nobody's going to be embarrassed. You know, they're not going to see something that's uh, unbiblical, let's put it that way. 18, universal justice, alluded to earlier. 19, universal belief and worship, also alluded to earlier. Um, Isaiah and, and uh, Micah say that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. No more atheists. Of course, I don't believe in them anyway. Um, 20, sickness reduced and healing. Can you imagine the advances in science? We can ask the Lord, what's the cure for the common cold? Wouldn't it be nice to have the cure for common cold, cancer, heart disease, on and on, on? And in fact, number 21, uh, Isaiah 65, 20 says that if a man dies at only 100 years old, these are, these are the mortals that will enter the millennial kingdom. If he's only 100 years old, it'll seem strange. And so longevity will just you know, be like the, uh, uh, the folks before the flood, the ages that you see, like in Genesis 5, those guys that, you know, like Methuselah, 969 years. I don't know if anybody will make it that far, but uh, prosperity, I've already alluded to that. A miraculous agri agricultural explosion in, uh, in Israel. Now, it's really amazing what Israel has done there, uh, you know, the last 50 to 70 years in the sense of turning that desert into, uh, you know, a place that grows things. But in the, uh, in the millennial kingdom, when Christ returns, it will be miraculous. It won't be through hard work and, and uh, science, but that the desert really will bloom. Uh, and then finally, and this, this one might be my favorite of all of them, zoos without bars or cages. Remember, the lion will eat straw like an ox, so I can finally go up and pet a lion or frolic with the polar bears. I don't know if you've ever had that urge. And so far, I've, I do have a bear story, but we won't go into that. I bet. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I would just love to play with like uh, bear cubs. Wouldn't you like to play with a bear cub? We'd be able to do that. They'll be vegetarians. So. Anyway, I know that this has been at best an overview this morning, but uh, it's, it's kind of an overall scope of the tremendous things to which we can look forward. This is, th these things are going to happen, folks, and it, I don't care how down you get. Uh, it's one of the reasons I like to study prophecy, because there is a very optimistic future to which we can look. Uh, there's a reason why Paul calls the rapture the blessed hope. Um, at the end of a discussion on the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, therefore comfort one another with these words. And that's been my goal this morning, is just spend a few minutes and try to, you know, get you started out on the right foot for the new year and be, uh, be encouraged. Uh, in fact, Christ at his second coming, uh, regarding his second coming, Luke 21.28, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And so who knows, it may be more nigh than we realize. So uh, let, me, let me pray with you as, as we close. Father, we just uh, thank you for this morning uh, that we've been able to worship you uh, through music, through prayer, through your word. 
And uh, I pray for these good folks. Uh, it's such an, a great little congregation here uh, for the new year. As Beth prayed earlier, we pray for each and every person that this uh, next year will be a special one and that you will be glorified in everything we do next year, that we'll have a sense of urgency about the, new, about the Great Commission and that we will, uh, we will serve you, which is such a privilege to serve the, the living God. In Christ's name we pray, amen.